This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Ferd Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Ferd Neiman here again today have another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. Got two guests for you today. Excited to bring these guys in. I got Jason Postel and Tyler Lekas. Excited to share their story with you and teach you some of their tips and tricks along the way. Guys, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Ferd. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, Ferd. Great. Well, we've talked a little bit offline a couple of times and got a decent feel for your guys' background, but for our audience that doesn't, maybe tell us your background, how you guys got into MH, what you guys are working on, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Um, yo, uh, this is Tyler Lekas. You know, I got into uh, the mobile home park space back in 2017. I ended up buying my first park down in Florida in, uh, in 2018, which is a little 55 space property. property. Um, ended up meeting Jason through a uh, a pretty funny uh, cold call. Uh, he ended up cold calling me about that 55 space park. And um, <clears throat> basically I, I told him to, um, to pound sand. And, uh, and then we, uh, we ended up kind of connecting after that. And, uh, you know, anyways, I, I ended up hanging up the phone on him and then uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, and then what ended up happening after that is he called back. And I was like, man, I kind of like this guy. Cause I was in sales. I was in the financial world uh, before I got into parks and uh we had a meeting for coffee and there was some synergy there. And then uh, Jason and I bought our first park together um, in Little Rock, Arkansas, 68 unit, two park portfolio um, in 2020. And since that time, we bought 752 units in, in the state of Arkansas. Um, so um, kind of a, uh, a rocket ship um, in the last couple of years. Um, I'm sure you've had the same sort of thing, low rates and, mm-hmm. you know, good cap rates, trying to just buy everything you possibly can. So um, that's kind of the, you know, the, the 50,000 foot view, Jason, did I miss anything there? No, that, that was it. And, um, as Jason Postel, I, you know, my, my background is quick is commercial real estate. I got in on the brokerage side. So just inside 10 years, um, before that after college played minor league baseball for a while. So I didn't really have a typical background in real estate, but, um, yeah, I got in as a brokerage apartment broker and, uh, transitioned around like 20, yeah, around that time, 2016, 17, transitioned into the the interest of, of mobile home parks. And I went, ended up going independent on a brokerage uh, around that time. And that was when I was still cold calling and um, dollars in my database, he owned that park. And and yeah, it was around, you know, holidays times. And uh, he yeah, hung up on me exactly like he said and <laughs> called him back. And I said, I got to at least get out what I got to say. And um, yeah, long, long story short, we we uh we ended up meeting and and uh, went from there and and yeah we've been been growing quickly and it's been good so interesting I don't think I've heard quite that story where somebody is um, cold calling the other person hangs up and then they become business partners so that's uh you guys got the interesting relationship that's great so yeah. tell me so you obviously a lot of focus in Arkansas um what how are you guys finding parks in Arkansas or what kind of parks are you buying there and, and, and is there did you specifically target Arkansas or is you that where you found the next one and then you just built around that nexus Ty, Jason, you want to take, take that? Yeah, oh, you yeah, those are right here. I'll hop in here a second to that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I mean, basically, um, uh, I had a I had a conversation, and he denies it to this day, which is pretty funny, uh, with Frank Rolf, you know, kind of the godfather of uh, mobile home parks. And um, I basically was like, hey, we're kind of getting priced out of Florida here. I said, where where would you go in the southeast um, that still probably has some opportunity? And uh, he's like, well, I hate the Southeast. I'm like, okay, well, if you didn't hate the Southeast, where would you go? You know? Um, and, uh, you know, Frank's just super, super blunt. So, um, and, uh, you know, he said, you know, I've, I, if I was going to go anywhere and I was just starting out and I was going to go to the Southeast, he goes, I love Little Rock. There's no institutional ownership there. He goes, I would look for parks there. And I said, okay. And so one of my buddies had just started working at Marcus and Millichap. He ended up digging up that deal for us. And then what ended up happening was, yeah, Jason is money on the phones. He's a, he's a killer out there. So what ended up happening was we called all the parks that surrounded that 68 units. And then I when we tag teamed it. So Jason hammered them on the phones, set up a meeting for me. And since it was all these Arkansas kind of old boys, 
um, I would go meet them, kind of shake their hand, show them that we're real. And then we ended up kind of, you know, buying a five park portfolio. Um, and then we bought, you know, a ton, another two parks. And then we bought, you know, again, we just kind of scaled out. And then when we got economies of scale in Little Rock, we moved to Northwest Arkansas and then Northern Arkansas and then Northern Northeast Arkansas. So, um, Anyways, that's how we kind of built our footprint. And the reason we liked Little Rock after we bought our first portfolio is, you know, our average price per pad is around twenty thousand, um, and our lot rents are three fifty. So it's really hard for us to get hurt in this current environment, um, or in, in the in the 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 price per pad that we we bought these things for. Um, and so we just found there was a there was a huge discrepancy between the rent. And the the value or the actual asset price we were buying these things for, um, and so that's that's just kind of why we continue to buy, and we haven't found really that many good deals. Like we bought, I think we've bought in four parks now for between ten and twelve thousand dollars a pad, um, and it's like you know we're kicking off sixteen, eighteen percent cash on cash returns, um, and our IRRs are in the thirties. It just we can't really get hurt there, so. Um, that's that's really that's the whole story kind of behind Arkansas. Jason, did I miss it? Did I miss anything there? No, and, and the deal size too. I mean, early on, just going back to Florida, we were just getting crushed. The cap rates kept compressing. These guys were coming in with these cash offers, hard day one on, and then you know, maybe uh the due diligence period was long. We just we just couldn't compete at that time. And so what we ended up finding was, yeah, that first 68 unit when we were piecing together these you know, 18. 33 space, 40, you know, those smaller, I mean, call it mid-size maybe, right? Our largest assets, 122 sites. Um, but we're flying under the radar of those institution guys. They're not looking at anything, right? Under two, three, maybe arguably 500 units. And then the private guy, just maybe the weekend warrior to say, right? That 30 to 50, he's, that's tough for him to to take down. So those, those deals we were we were able to, to put together um, and it's it's worked out well, right? Operationally, it's it's a challenge, right? To get those small deals doesn't make sense. We self-manage, but it's um, it's it's worked out. So that's where we've really capitalized on getting that scale in a, in a market and, and grow. But, but yeah, that covered it. Great. So let me follow up. What kind of what kind of uh, occupancy are you guys pursuing? I mean, you buying these deals that stabilized or are they fifty percent occupied? Anything in between? What's the preference? Uh, kind of everything in between other than just stable. I, I, I mean, there's been one, our largest asset, 122. Uh, that's been essentially the cleanest, most occupied. That was 100% occupied, but it had 30% delinquency mm. when we were coming into that. And every other project has been an extreme value add, you know, 50 to, they, they have not been stable, but that, that deal ended up turning out great because we did work it out with the tenants to wipe their slate clean and we ended up 98 percent collections the first month nice. but yeah every, other than that i mean that's been a monster too in itself now but it's other than that it's been a, a huge uh infill project and and uh some yeah tough tough turnarounds Don? oh I, i've not done uh, I, don't, I don't own any parks in arkansas how's the how is infill there how is working with the cities and it, you know as far as good getting home sets and all that is it hard to find contractors like in a lot of locations or is there is it pretty uh, readily available it's, on that. Yeah, go ahead, Ty. Yeah, I mean, contractors, as you probably know, for you know, if they're uh, you know, if they're not beating their girlfriend or smoking meth, you know, they're they're <laughs> maybe working. Um, so you know what I mean? I just those guys, the guys in that industry, I just don't know what what it is about those guys, but it, it seems like nobody wants to work and they don't show up for the job on time. And if they do, there's some problem somewhere. Uh, anyways, so I we probably face the same same sort of issues that everybody else does. Um, however, you know, there is contract. We have found a good, good crew to, um, you know, kind of set our homes. Um, they, another good crew to kind of deliver our homes. Uh, we've got another good crew that does skirting and steps, you know, that, that whole nine yards. Um, Little Rock is not friendly at all towards mobile home parks. They don't really enforce their, um, the, the new homes that we have, you know, coming in. So, Again, they, they kind of leave us alone, um, but they they really don't like mobile home parks um, at all, and um, they're they're pretty predatory towards them, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, we've had some issues with the city, and and we've resolved a couple of items. But it's it's definitely um, uh, it's definitely you know we've had we've had our own sets of issues, and um, you know putting new homes actually on pads. What we found is the, a lot of the parks there um, are smaller. 
And so, um, and when I say smaller, I mean the, 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 the turning to actually get off the road mm. is like really small driveways to get off the road. And then there's smaller pads, right? I mean, these things were built in the fifties and sixties. And so we've actually found that one of our biggest obstacles is actually getting the home to be driven onto the park. Um, so then we can actually drop it on a pad. Um, so we actually have to have the highway guys drop these mobile homes on our vacant, a piece of vacant dirt that we have. And then we have the smaller toter crew with the trans lift to actually go in and maneuver the house around and actually get it into the park. Like a, a problem I never even thought right. that we'd be facing. Like I always just thought like the highway guys, you know, they drive it in, they drop it, you block level and anchor it and you're all good to go. But man, it's uh, getting new homes. I mean, I, for we've talked about this before, but getting new homes on pads. I mean, let me tell you, for your audience out there, any new operators or anybody that says that's going to invest in a deal as an LP in a heavy, heavy value add project, like, and the, the, if the sponsors isn't kind of, you know, raising enough capital and, and kind of giving enough time frame to a drop those houses and set those houses up and then lease those houses up, man, you better be asking some tough questions there, you know? Um, Cause it's, it's a major undertaking. Um, I'm uh, sure. I'm, yeah. yeah it's, it's a, that's a good point. I mean, that's one thing to look at with people forget about that. A lot of times when they evaluate a park is how long are the lots? Can they fit modern size homes? You'd be stuck buying 1970s homes and or buying park models, which are, in my opinion, overly priced. So, right. and, then, and then can you squeeze them on the homes, on the lots? I had one park where we could barely get it up the drive mm -hmm. to get into the park. So we had to basically go around another street. Luckily, there was two entrances of this park. We'd go around the other road and take it through a vacant lot. And it's like, well, we're going to fill this lot last and just take the home across the lots because wow. we have a 76 foot home. It wouldn't the, just the, the pitch of the roadway, the entryway, we couldn't get up there and they were bottoming out. And we had one get stuck. And then to, to get it pulled through, it starts to bend the frame and it can mess up the home. So yeah, it's, it's definitely, it can be a challenge. We're using those trans lifts are impressive, you know, to see those guys move those things. Yeah. And I've had, I've had to get strategic with, you know, because you can typically pull the home easier than you can push it. So on the toter truck, obviously they're pulling it. But then when you get a trans lift, it's like, oh, crap, I want the front window with the light sconces and stuff. Obviously, I want that yeah. facing the road. But in order to get on this lot, they're going to have to turn it around. And it's hard to do. They can't really do it as easily. And I've had truckers. There's one guy in particular that he came. He brought three different homes to my park. Those were new homes that I'd ordered from True or Clayton. And the guy was just sweating bullets, like he'd get out of his truck and he's just like, looks like he's, you know, ready to die. And yeah. he, he, he hit a fence on one. He hit a car, a moving car on one. And then on the last one, eventually I told him, don't, I took a picture of the guy and I said, don't send this guy on my property again. It was raining. I had paved asphalt streets and then I had soft gravel parking areas. And I told him, you got to get it off the street enough so that people can, until the, the installer can come, so people can pass through. But you got to put that back to the tires on the gravel because it's soaking wet grass. And he missed it and he puts it down. He parks it one wheel on the oh, mud no. and one wheel on the asphalt. And the home just tipped oh. over and it tipped all the way over, not all the way on its complete side, but all the way over to like the uh the water line coming out underneath the hot water heater and that and it hit the ground it snapped off and then it just kind of laid there in the mud and i'm like how am i supposed to you couldn't pull it out anymore so it was a huge job getting that home squared away but it, it, it's it, this guy was like oh i can fit it in anywhere and then he realized no you can't so it's definitely a challenge navigating i had to pay you know pay i just basically gave gift cards and candy and stuff to the the guy like the plumbing shop across the street so that I could pull in their parking lot and then back into my park because you couldn't make a 90 degree turn um, to pull in. So yeah, it definitely is a, an issue that not everybody, you don't really learn it until you learn it. And it's, you know, what do they say? Good, you know, good experience um, comes from, no way is it good judgment comes from experience, experience. Comes yeah. From, experience comes from bad judgment. So like I had the you know, original bad judgment. I got some experience and now I'm pretty smart, <laughs> but yeah. The hard yeah. And I think another thing, and again, not to, not to beat this horse to death here, but I just think another thing people don't look at is, or a thing, a huge mistake we made is, is existing utility infrastructure in each one of the lots. 
you think, oh, I got to fill up, you know, nine or 10 lots. As long as I can get the homes on the lots, because we've had lots that are big enough for these houses. And then we don't look at, is there an existing utility pole there? Right. Is there existing 200 amp box there? Is there existing power lines that are going underground or overhead? Mm. Or do we have to call the utility provider, get the overhead lines or underground lines installed? And again, that takes months. Right. And then you got to hire an electrician. They want to charge three, four grand for a, a pole, a box, and then connecting that the the home all together. And then it's, hey, are the lines, the sewer lines collapsed? Because these these lots haven't been used in 20 years. You know, I mean, it's all this stuff, all this due diligence that you got to do on the front end to make sure that you're, you know, the difference between, you know, a $15,000, oh, just skirting steps, utility hookups and HVAC and a $30,000, hey, all brand new utilities that we have to run, plus all the stuff for the house is, is yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, double your cost or, you know, maybe two and a half times your cost that you're, you're putting in these houses. So um, yeah, anybody, yeah, whatever, any operator, um, like yeah. I said, I won't, I won't bring yeah, it up yeah. again. It's yeah good point it's good point especially the the gas and electric because this because if the utility provider says we must upgrade these for life safety reasons you don't really have a leg to stand on you can't say no they're not going to turn the power on i mean that you have to you know, they're the they're king and they say you got to do this you're like okay so it's kind of a it's for me it's kind of a, a, a difficult dance of do i ask for permission during dd or do i just do it and hope they're not paying attention and they just hook it up, you know, after I own it and recognizing I may have to, you know, later budget. I've had to go both ways. I'm like, I'm not going to ask. And I hook them up and then nobody ever says anything. And then I've had, then like 10 in, they're like, Hey, uh, do you have an electrician working on that? Oh, you got to upgrade that pedestal and we need to go underground. And like, then you're, you know, then it's all of a sudden like poof, and there's 10 grand. Right. And so yeah, good, good point. So J Jason question for you on, how are you guys selling homes? Are you doing, you know, you're selling them, are you renting them? Some combination and, and what's your business model as far as do you desire park owned homes or or prefer not to have park owned homes? Yeah. So we we sell all the homes, you know, 10 10 owned home that's across our portfolio, right? 85% right now are, are 10 owned homes. We've uh, we've tested a, a few different uh models on selling those homes, right? So when when we've had uh park owned homes, we've We've our goal is to sell those off on a lease option, and and we've we've had some nightmare stories that we could touch on because I, I think these podcasts are great when people do share like we just talked about some some nightmare situations, other operators or maybe people trying to get in the space don't even think of or hear about other than all the good right so right. um yeah these are great questions to to cover at all but um yeah the short answer is ten own home is our model but you know we've we've had some park own homes that we've uh you know merry christmas happy birthday here you go and 10 own home we, we try to sell off or we've you know there was one community arch right next to the land development we were, we were briefly talking about that was uh, probably worst case scenario almost other than uh, going 100 percent vacant you know 33 base park goes 50 percent, and that was because we were just hey you have this option to buy your home people freaked out they're like i don't want to own some people just don't want ownership we've we learned that was not the best way to approach it, right? So then we got a little softer with some of our approach of of uh, different options. Hey, you 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 can if you want be a homeowner. It'll you know, whether you're if they're paying let's say seven fifty, essentially that payment will stay the same. You put a down payment. You know we've gone different directions with it and had much better success than just a hard fast uh, one one direction. Obviously, so uh, that's worked out well. And, and yeah, some some homes we're getting from the cash program, right? Brand brand new homes that we're selling um, on the lease option. But, um, but yeah, it's wor worked out well. And even the existing homes right now, we, we purchased a 49 site with, with some renovation homes that we're, we're renovating. Uh, and it'll, it'll probably be a mix of the two, but yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna uh, renovate those, sell them on a, a lease option to purchase contract. And, and that's that's done done really well. Okay, so I want to touch on you mentioned this. A lot of people th think on these, you know, some of these older homes. So hey, just give them away or tell people park on homes. Like, it's your it's your house. Congratulations, free house. But what you you just articulated it when you guys you did that just across the board. Sounds like with thirty of them said free house, and then half the people said we don't want a free house. We liked having a landlord we could call to fix stuff, and they and then they just moved out, and then you half have of a them Now I got half the tenants, and I got half the problem houses back. Exactly. That's exactly. 
what happened. Yeah. So I think I've heard other other strategies I've seen people do with that is we've we haven't had to do it in bulk. We really haven't we really have because I've I've tried it a few times and had kind of similar experience. So we typically just like write out that resident when it when they move out, then we we'll we'll make life safety repairs. We're not gonna like upgrade the cabinets or the countertops. But typically those homes have some serious life safety repairs, you know, holes on the floor, things like that. Um, in those cases, you know, what we would do if we try to convert somebody, we'll say, like, hey, your rent is seven fifty, lot rents three hundred. We'll give you the house, and the new lot rents four fifty. And mm-hmm. they'll be like, okay, well, I've got two fifty a month of savings. Now we tell them, now that you're saving two fifty a month, but you own a house, you got to pay the taxes, you got to pay for insurance, and you need to set aside some of those savings for you know repairs and maintenance and upgrades. Realistically, mm-hmm. not that many of them do it. You know, and mm-hmm. then you end up. So it's I've got so I kind of got away from that because it's kind of backfired. Where it's like great, they say great. I got four fifty. I have four fifty coming in. The first time their you know toilet doesn't work, they just quit using that toilet. Well, now they're using the other one, and then they clog it, and they need our help. <laughs> and it's like, come on, guys. I mean, we've had people where they just we've asked them like, why aren't you using the other restroom? They go, oh, we haven't used that one in six months. It got clogged. We just we just taped the lid shut. Like that was their way of solving the problem. And they're like, what well, was our house? We couldn't call you anymore. So we yeah. just, we went from a two bedroom out, a two bath house to a one bath house. I was just like, really? You, you mean, you could have asked our maintenance guy. We would have probably done it for $50 or you could have called a plumber, you know, like, yeah, but we just, we just used it in a bathroom. I'm like, you have five people living here. Yeah. <laughs> we just take turns. I'm like, I mean, it's a, so that, that, that defies logic in a lot of respects. Um, because they had the 150 to call a plumber because they were saving 250 a month, right? Right. But where'd that money go? I don't know. It's a mystery. I've I've given up on trying to understand where and how people spend their money or you know, make their decisions. But okay, so well, it's like to, oh, go ahead. Oh sorry for I was just gonna extrapolate on that. I was just gonna say, you know, we want we want window coverings, good solid window coverings at our communities. Blinds, you know, uh, you know, um, curtains um you know something that's proper not not your bath towel not tin foil um and we always tell everybody hey look you know if you have if you have an issue with um you know your blinds break your dog eats some or your kid you know breaks them off you buy the blinds we'll install them you know we sent that notice out to our residents um but nobody calls us no. and then we give them a fine because they don't have proper window coverings up and it's just like and again like you said, defies logic. I, I've stopped trying to figure it out because it like it'll drive you crazy. You're like, why aren't you using your toilet? It cl- you get a plunger or like a little snake. You borrow it from the. I mean, anyways, it's just I don't, I don't get it. The people just left their houses. It's hard. It's hard to figure people. Out. I had a guy one time where his his cat ruined the blinds. He was on a corner lot with a big bay window, and there's these big long blinds. So they weren't the cheapo blinds that I had to buy. And he was gone. Had the manager knock on the door. The guy's wife was home, and we said, "Hey, we want to fix your blinds." We even bought them because of the, because it was on a corner lot that was really, you know, really visible. She goes, okay, sounds great. Maintenance guy goes on Depot, picks up some blinds, comes back, installs them. They look great. The next day, there's no blinds you can see in their house. And we went by like, what happened? She goes, my husband said, you're not going to be fixing our house. I'll fix our house when I feel like it. So he took him down to prove he was the boss. I'm like, you could have said, thank you. You could have just said nothing, but why would you do that? And it was, same guy, I had a painting program where I subsidized all the, the painting for this part. We painted like 30 houses. And I said, it's $500 a house. You pay for the paint. I'll pay for the labor. Half and half. Or it was like 200 for the paint and 300 for the labor at that time. And I had to get the permission because it was their house. Most people jumped at it. This guy wouldn't do it. I had pre approved had 16 color combos, so you couldn't paint it orange or anything like that. And this guy said no. And I basically said, look, under the lease, you, you got peeling paint and stuff. You got to fix it up. So I'm, I could find you for peeling paint or you could let me paint your house. And it's, it's a, this is a you know, once in a lifetime gift. And the guy said, let me think about it. And that weekend he painted it himself bright blue. And I was like, and it stands out. I'm like, it looks okay. But I'm like, you showed me, you know, save me 250 bucks. He painted his own house. Um, yeah. God. Yeah. yeah was, these, yeah. The rest, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, we could go down the rabbit hole there. I'm sure pretty far. There's a oh, yeah. lot of guys that just don't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. And it's, you know, you find you and and guys will, 
on purpose, they'll, they'll let you find them. Like we've been finding this guy $150 a month on $350 lot rent. And because he's got like refrigerators and everything else in his front yard. And we offer, we've offered him now like a dozen times. We said, Hey, all we're, all we're going to do is charge you 750 bucks and we're going to go clean up all. And it's like, we're talking like a 30 yard, maybe more of stuff around this house. And, um, and again, we've had some occupancy issues at this one property. So we're letting him slide because we don't want to refill his lot because his house is in shambles, et cetera. But it's like, He's been getting charged. I mean, he's probably, we probably charged him. I don't even know. Close to $3,000 in fees now. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he just continues to eat it. And you're like, all right, dude. Yeah. Good luck. You know, it defies logic. Um, but yeah. uh, for, for, I was going to ask you, I know this is your podcast, but I was going to ask you, so you have found that giving houses away um, doesn't really work, especially when they're like, have you found that, that same thing when houses are vacant um, and you are just trying to give them the way to the general public as well. Have we've tried that? giving. We've, it, it's the, it depends on the park. Um, if we try to give away a house, we prefer to just, rather than market it and give it to anybody. We just ask one of the maintenance guys, like, "Hey, do you want a free house?" And then they'll find a cousin or a friend and be like, "All right, free house." And we somebody they're like, "Look, look, you can't live in it until you fix it up, and you got to fix it up." And and then they often, you know, what do they spend their money on? the inside i get it i'd spend my money on the inside too so that doesn't work for us we want the outside too so what we started right. doing was we say yeah. here's a free house we paint it we fix the skirting we fix the deck we put in a gravel driveway and we say free house you owe us 500 dollars for the exterior upgrade and then we charge them 500 dollars for the house that looks good on the outside mm -hmm. and we have better success with that um if you give away some states you can't even give away houses most states you can give away a house um, that's not livable as long as you don't sell a house not livable, but that can get dicey. And we had it happen one time in a state where you can, and we we gave away a house and it was not livable. And everybody knew it was not livable. We didn't represent it was livable. Again, it didn't even have walls. It was like four walls, no cabinets, no kitchen counters, no bedrooms, no bathrooms. It was just a blank slate that somebody else demoed the interior and then didn't do anything. I'm like, clearly it wasn't a house. And the guy's like, started working out. We saw materials come in. And all this stuff, and then come to find out it's 10 degrees outside, and the manager's like, Hey, I'm worried these guys are gonna freeze to death. And we're like, Is their furnace broken? He goes, They never put a furnace in. We're like, What he goes, No, they're just it was a free place to be out of the rain, and they stored their stuff. They sleep on a mattress on the floor, or they get where do they go to the bathroom? He goes, McDonald's or work. So where do they shower? He's like, I don't, they just don't really shower. And I was like, what? So I'm like, well, they weren't supposed to be living there. Like, well, they moved in. So we're like, good grief. So then we're like, we got to put them in a hotel. We don't want to freeze to death. But we're like, don't go tell all your friends. We don't want to have a bunch of people put in hotels. We just, you know, but so that was, that was kind of a nightmare of giving away a free home. So we've gotten really pessimistic about it. Um, so we've, it's, it's kind of, a, depends on the park, depends on the deal, but like, half the time is better just to demo it and move on now some parks hard to infill and things like that i don't really want to if, if, if it's a if it's a good park where i have good demand i'll just demo it and bring in a different one so we probably demoed i don't know a dozen houses last year and just replaced them but we probably gave away i don't know half that many um not that many you know one park i gave away 25 um and it worked like magic and then like a year and a half later, I got like 10 of them back. So it still was worth it because of the, all the net occupancy. But getting them back is a huge pain because you'd think, in theory, when the first parts of this on, give it the same house five times. You know, give it away. And the first guy's like, I'm going to fix it. I'm handy. And then he'd clean it out. And then he'd disappear. And the next guy would come in and he'd, you know, fix the wall and put down subfloor. All right. And the next, you, you, people are like, you can sweat equity, but you can't sweat equity of fridge. You can't sweat equity, you know, an, air, an air conditioner. Yeah, you know, they can yeah. go get cabinets for cheap somewhere and, and makeshift a bedroom and things like that. So this house, we kept getting back. And in theory, and this time it actually worked. That one it actually kind of worked where it kept getting a little better because people were actually working on it and not living in it. Mm. But most time what we found is you give it away is they're not getting better. The people live on, on, on you know, scraps. Like we give them a the house and there's no flooring. It's just, it's just subfloor. And then you go in there six months later and it's still subfloor. 
Like you guys didn't buy vinyl or you didn't buy like used carpet or buy a rug. Nope. And there's a dog pee everywhere, poop everywhere. Like, yeah, whatever. We just yeah. let the dog go on the floor. Don't even pick it up. You know, I went in the house with like 200 piles of dog poop. I'm like why, why, you know, you, you can't make sense of it. So in, in general, the handyman special free home, I think it's, it's about as much trouble to demo it versus give it away. Um, so I, I have parks where I'll do both, for them, but I'm more and more and more. I'm just like demo it and move on. Um, and I had a guy at one park. We sold this park actually now, but we had a guy, he worked, he did our landscaping mowing and he had a construction company and he had four houses in the park and he had a whole crew of Hispanic guys that would come to, they would go home for the winter to Mexico and they'd come back during the rest of the year and work construction and landscape. And he'd put these guys up in these houses. Well, then we had another house that come vacant. We'd say, you want it? He'd say, yeah, okay. And he'd renovate and he'd put, he'd bring two or three more guys and he'd just give them free housing as part of their work. And mm. we had, a, we had a shop that we wanted to renovate into a site, site built house. We thought it was like 20 grand. It was a masonry building. We go through the city and the city wants us to put in modern size windows, you know, modern size doors. And it was going to cost like 80 grand to fix this thing to code. Mm. If we wanted to buy wow. house. So we just went to this guy, Sammy, and said, how'd you like to rent this as a shop? Put all your tools. And he had to get mowers and trucks and stuff. He goes, just rent this as a shop. You can't live in it. It had a bathroom in it. Um, and he goes, okay. So we just, lot rent was 400. We just rented him the house for 400. And he just paid it. And he just, and he fixed it up and made it a shop. And it got his vehicles off the street and, you know, his lawnmower trailers and stuff. And it's good for him, good for us. So. That was like the best handyman special deal because it had lots of ancillary impacts and we made him paint it and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, that's uh, the only, oh, sorry for me to cut go you ahead. off. Go ahead. Oh, I was just, oh, I was just going to say the, some success that we've been having is we came up with a repair document mm -hmm. and basically our leasing agent now says, Hey, look, just letting you know, this is a handyman special. So we, you have to send over a bank statement with $5,000 at least in your bank account and you have to agree to this repair agreement. And this has to be started in 90 days and completed in 180 days. Um, and we have found that we have a lot less people applying for these handyman specials. Sure. But when we we actually, when we get somebody to apply and agree, they usually get the work done now. Uh, yeah, I'm, sure. not saying, I'm not saying 100% of the time. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we're, we're batting a thousand over here. But it's it, that's been something that's, that's worked for us. But it, it took... Mm -hmm. A lot of times can kick to the teeth, like you said. A guy, you know, a guy comes in. Like we had a, we had somebody who said they were going to agree to to fix up a house early on, and um, and it was like a couple of months. And I asked my manager, I said, "What's going on with that house?" And uh, she said, "Oh, I don't know. They they haven't been working on it in a couple months." So I went over there, and they stripped all the drywall out of there, all the electrical, all the cabinets, all the the drywall in between all the houses. So it was this whole house was a bunch of basically studs and uh, subfloor, um, and like you know, I mean, when I say studs, I mean all the all the uh, two by four framing and then just subfloor. And I was like, God, okay, so they stole everything out of here. Got it, okay. Um, uh, anyway, so it's just it's the the. It, it, I love when brokers go in and advertise handyman specials and like, oh, it's easy. All you got to do is give these houses away. You're like, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, probably, probably that easy. That's why the old owner hasn't done it yet. Cause it's that easy, you know? So that's yeah, just, yeah. Anyway, it's just another, another myth in the business that I, you know, I, hopefully your listeners will, um, you know, take, take some, uh, piece of wisdom away from, you know? Yeah. No, agreed. Good points. Yeah. Jason, you got anything to add on that topic or you want to get any other tips for sales or finding deals or maybe any other strategies you want to cover? Yeah, I know the, the, yeah, the, the repair denim now, that was big. And, and yeah, that was a good point for, I mean, just, just gifting the homes has not worked. Um, cause we'll still even have uh, people put down a good payment like five grand. We had one, one woman put down 5,000 then she abandoned the home. I forgot about like, we couldn't even figure it out. I was like, what, what's going on? Um, but yeah, the, the home sales, um, you know, once you find that, that sweet spot of where people will lease it from, and again, we're in Southwest Little Rock. So it's a different market maybe than, uh, fit Fayetteville or uh, other markets, but, um, but no, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the infill is challenging, but we've, we found success 
and um, yeah, a little money down, get them some skin in the game. And then the Lonnie deal, you know, we've, we've had some success with that. We don't want to get too out of hand, but if anybody's not familiar on your listeners on, on that, you know, we've found some guys that will uh, repair the homes. Right. And, and they'll, they'll do that and save, save us that cost. And then they'll rent them out. Right. They'll make a little spread. Um, like I said, we don't let that get too out of hand, but that's, that's definitely helped uh, a few of our properties, you know, and they've, they've had a few in each, each property. Um, I don't think Tyler, what they, they're not getting over uh, 20% of the, the whole park, um, you know, controlling that, but um, that's, that's worked out fairly well too. Just giving it to someone that's reputable. We know does a good job renovating and then we, we still always ask to screen the tenant. Sometimes that, you know, we, we can't control that always, right? Because they'll be moving in the middle of the night or moving a cousin, but that's hard to police. But we, we at least put it in writing somewhere to to try to monitor that. But that that's worked well. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, that's that's been our you know, just marketing, just Facebook, uh, Show Mojo, you know, just those platforms that are syndicating it out. It's really just our main leads. Um, it's, yeah, it's worked well. Right, Jason. Sorry, Bert. Yeah, let me jump in. Let me jump in the Lonnie dealer just for our audience too. You know, a couple concerns on that. You just want to make sure that your Lonnie dealers don't get too high a percentage of the homes because it could mess up your future financing because they kind of have you over a barrel if they want to move them out. But then also, yeah, I recommend, I even give them, if I let people sublease, I'll give them my template home lease. And I'll say, look, you must use this form lease. And it says that the landlord, the land lessor is an intended third-party beneficiary. So I can enforce rules against both you, the Lonnie dealer and your resident and all residents need to go through our background check. And I care less about their financial situation because I'm counting on Lonnie to pay me rent, but I care more about their criminal background. So um, Lonnie's on the hook either way. And I've, and I've, I've had situations where the tenants have gotten the sub tenants have gotten sideways with their landlord, mm. but they wanted to stay. So they'll come to, they've come to me and said, at one time in particular, there was a, a grandpa that was paying for his 20 year old niece and her, her granddaughter and her friend. And they were supposed to pay like seven fifty a month to mm. Lonnie. And then I was supposed to get 400. He just came to me and he said, I'll pay for the 400 and I'll pay for their water but I'm not paying their home rent. And then I later found out Lonnie's like, yeah, they never pay me. I just, I haven't gotten around to evicting them and I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm like, they're paying me directly. He didn't know they were paying me. I figured he knew he thought I was just being gracious to him, not coming after him for being eight months behind. I'm like, your tennis may be eight months behind with you, but they're paying me every month. Wow. And wow. he's just like, Oh, so it was a weird relationship. Um, but they did that for a long time. I don't know. I don't even know what ever happened to the guy. Hmm. Um, but anyway, well, guys, other other tips or tricks or ideas for our audience before we go? Yeah, Jason, you want to talk about how we're, you know, kind of our our acquisitions and, and kind of how we're drumming up deals these days and kind of what we've, um, kind of our, our timeline of how long we've been talking to sellers and that that kind of road? Because that's, Jason, Jason's an expert on the acquisition side as well. I don't think you mentioned that at the beginning of the call, so. Yeah, I think that's a good tip. Just everybody's trying to find deals, right? I mean, it's like the money and the deals, right? Those, those are two. So yeah, we could definitely speak on that. That's a good, good, um, you know, again, just to go back to the, the small to midsize in a Arkansas market, right? It, it wasn't, there's, there's competitive markets all over the place. Um, but yeah, it's really, you know, we leverage brokers, we do, but probably about 85% plus is, is just direct, direct owner, right? And, and there's, Lots of ways to go about that. I personally, we haven't found much better than just a direct cold call to the seller, right? And we've we've worked on an acquisition team, and and just because you know Tyler and I can't wear a million hats for forever, right? So we're we're delegating slowly but surely. Um, but yeah, you know the the direct <clears throat> the direct contact, especially when you you first get that one property, right? You get over that one deal, it, it's much easier to to get those, those, uh, owners call it warm, but when you're an owner that you own down the road and you're calling and saying, Hey, I own a property next door. It's a little warmer than just a, a broker or not owning in that market, just calling them because they're getting called all day by brokers, other owners, direct competition. So, um, but having the ability to, to, like I was saying earlier with, you know, I'll go call them, he'll meet them. That, that goes a long way, you know, in, in some of these other markets, because, Maybe up in New York or Florida, down here, they're used to so many guys calling out a market. 
you're maybe not getting that eye to eye to handshake meeting right away. Um, but that has gone a long way and, and it's helped with, you know, and we couple it with direct mailing campaigns. Um, we've, we've done some ringless voicemails, right? We've all gotten those, which kind of sound, you know, and, and there's the so many ways, right? <laughs> What'd you say it works? Those are the worst. Oh, the worst. Oh, the worst. I get them yeah. all, I get them almost every day. And I'm like, does anyone sell to this person? I, I, I might the have same gotten... guy, the Asian <laughs> accent. I'm like, you don't, you're not really the one buying this. You are clearly like some, you know, virtual assistant making these calls. Please stop calling me. Exactly. And, and training a team to sound, it's just, I, I know they're out there and they do it and guys do it. And we've drummed up deals. We've had virtual assistants. We still do, but there's just having the true owner or a principal or someone that's in just speaks a whole different other language, right. To that owner. So uh, yeah, all the other fancy stuff. I mean, now there's AI you know, guys calling in, I've tested that. And that's like, it start. you know, we don't want to tarnish our name yet with just random robots. It's like, Oh, MHCI group. Uh, you know, no, we want to talk to them and know we're, we're it, you know, talking. So that's really, I wish there was a magic bullet, but you know, other than that, just when, getting into a property and doing the renovations, right? Within the first 60 days, we're putting in new paving. We're, we're doing a lot of upgrades aesthetically other than just bumping rent and then nothing to really show for until later down the road or at some point. So that's really drummed up to some of the city officials that maybe didn't love the idea. Like, oh, well, we'd rather this get bulldozed and then have an A-class development here to just for some beautification of the, the city, right? Right. And yet they're trying to uh, solve the affordable housing crisis, which that doesn't do it. 2,100 for one bedroom. So we have had actually had a couple of deals where you know, Tyler will be on site and the city officials say, hey, you know what? You guys are doing a really good job here. You need to talk to this slumlord that we've been trying to get out of here for years. And then it'll turn into a little lead where it's, oh, okay, hey, this worked out. And then, um, but yeah, it's always gotten back to just picking up the phones and, and calling them. And then they'll eventually call back. Like right now, we we just closed on a deal. That was three years of following up, following up and following up. And that's that's tough to do after a while. You're just like, oh, I'm calling this guy again. This, you know, it's like you're almost harassing them until they, they tell you no. Then we'll just say, all right, six months or a year. And then they've come back to us now. A lot's changed. So maybe they got a little greedy, right? And, and now they're saying, okay, that was a pretty good offer they brought. And then um, we're getting some now inbound from, from up front. But yeah, I would just say listener, you know, for your listeners out there, they're either trying to get in deals or, or grow their portfolio. I mean, the leverage brokers, of course, but you know, I've been a broker, I am a broker, but we all do know too, the broker's job is to get the highest and best price for the seller oftentimes. And you're right. bidding against other brokers for those assignments. So it, it does climb, um, but we do, we will we'll leverage brokers and, and um, they, if you know them well or make that relationship, they'll call you before they even take it to market, right? And that's the best case scenario. Right. Um, but yeah, I think that's really our, again, wish there was a magic bullet. Nobody wants to hear, oh, cool call. And that, yeah, nobody really loves doing that, but that's that's really where we found it. And some direct mailers and just- So call. how do you, are you doing the cold calls or is your virtual, what is, what's the, I want to hear your, your strategy as far as virtual assistant versus next level versus one of you talking to- is it you guys, or is it a mix? Are you calling some and the VAs or the VAs just saying, hey, will you, will you talk to Jason? Yeah, no, good good question. So <laughs> yeah, I'd love to say we got stuff now. It's they're handing it off warm. And, and the, we actually terminated that. We're, we're restructuring that acquisition side. So where it was is there was some deals that they were just cold calling. The owner with the basic script, I would practice with them and, and, and then when they got a principal on the phone or Tyler, myself, right? Um, that was basically all they were supposed to do is just get a warm intro to then have Tyler either meet them in person. I'll call them back for a, a more detailed conversation. That that worked out okay. It just, it, it I mean, still to this day though, we, we don't have that set up. So there's still a lot of calls. Tyler still meet, I mean, he's met some of these sellers now. I don't know, Tyler probably spent 50 hours with some of them. Um, it's been wild, but uh, yeah, I mean, the process has been, I mean, today, since we don't have the acquisition team going full steam yet. Yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, just a cold call. If never spoke to them, which now at this point, we've almost talked to every owner in Arkansas, right? So it's more of just like a follow-up. Hey, we spoke a while ago, just checking in. Here's what's happening, bring a little value. And then it'll either be like, hey, Tyler's in the area, <clears throat> um, like tomorrow. 
we right uh, we got a deal looking at um and yeah it's really still Tyler and I just two man band in this thing and and we're we're getting that acquisition side because now we have some more automations and follow ups and back end emails and text but it's crazy to see that not everybody's in with the technology still in some of these places they're, they're yeah so yeah good stuff thanks for sharing that yeah um all right guys well we're wrapping up here any other last minute comments or if not where can people uh find you guys yeah you can you can find us on uh linkedin at um mhci group um you can just type in our our company name i'm also on linkedin tyler at, at uh you know just tyler leckis um and uh, i don't have an instagram i'm old uh <laughs> i don't have i mean i have a facebook uh but you probably uh you know you probably find some political stuff about uh whatever you know political <laughs> or guns or whatever on there so uh you know it's probably not about mobile home parks which your listeners would probably be more interested in um so uh, we, we're trying to beef up our social media here a little bit, but again, we're uh, we're old farts, so we're uh, 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 it's uh, it's not the easiest thing. And Jason and I like to fly under the radar as well. But anyways, Jason, get where where can people uh, find you? No, I mean, yeah, I said, I mean, MHCI Group, that, that's us. I mean, the email is always pretty pretty easy to get a hold of. Jason at MHCIGroup.com, and yeah, same with Tyler. So, um, but yeah, Ferg, we really appreciate you having us on here, and hope, hope we brought some value, and appreciate you sharing as always. It's awesome to hear. Hear not always the great, right? What what's really <laughs> happening on on the operations side, right? So always challenges. It's awesome. All right, guys. Well, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Ferd. Yep. You've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.